Okay, so today we are going to be discussing two books, Piranesi by Susanna Clark and The Bone Shard Daughter by Andrea Stewart. So, Stewart? Stewart. So, uh, this is a fantasy mystery and this is fantasy. This is going to be spoiler free for both of these because I want, I want to push these on you. I want to make you read them. So this is going to be spoiler free. Please hang out with me for this whole video and learn about two books that I really, really, really loved. Starting with Piranesi because it's shorter, uh, so it's gonna be a little bit vaguer. So Piranesi by Susanna Clark is 245 pages. You can do it. So I'm gonna keep this super vague because it's short and because it's a mystery, so you really don't need to know very much about it, and it would be better if you let it just unfold for you. So the basic setup is we're following Piranesi, whose name I'm not sure if I'm saying correctly, but uh, it's this is the, a man who is in a house that I want to call it sentient. It's, it's ever breathing, ever changing. It's like a labyrinth where all these rooms are connected and, and each room has its, has different things about it. Our main character, we don't know his name, but he's called Piranesi uh, by the other. So our main character is in this house with one other, his, he's, and he's called the other because it's you know, our main character and the other guy. You get it. The other has decided to start calling him Piranesi. We don't know why. And he's just kind of accepted that this is what he's called. So we we read this story through journal entries by our main character, who's just a delight to hang out with. He has some memory loss. He doesn't know why he's here, how he got here, what the purpose of this house is. Uh, but what we do know is that he wants to explore this house and uh and and he's figuring out his own date system and his own his own systems of being able to mark where he's been and mark how to get to the next place as well as marking the passage of time and there are i guess i'll put it this way this is a very slow book in the beginning where in the beginning of the story we're really just exploring the house with Piranesi we're we're really just uh figuring out a little bit more about this world that he's spent this time in and what his routines are here and just getting to know the way Piranesi views his world in that we have some oddities that happen. The other, the, the other character, is a friend, a companion of Piranesi, but they also don't spend that much time together, and he seems to have more knowledge, more understanding, and more resources, but he doesn't exactly divulge why. But Piranesi trusts him wholeheartedly, and he trusts the house wholeheartedly. And what I want to say, that's all I'm going to say about the plot. Well, actually, I'll say this too. In this very slow beginning where we're just seeing the world and exploring the house, um, I found it to be a delight, and I'll explain why in a minute, but also I'll say there are little inconsistencies or oddities about this house where it feels like we're in a totally different world, but there are little things of our world, yours and my world, that are in there, or little oddities, little things that don't seem to fit just right. And that's where the mystery comes in. It is a slow beginning, but it's a very atmospheric and um, beautiful beginning that's very easy, in my opinion, to just sink into with Piranesi, but also is a mysterious beginning, and we get a lot of clues that will lead us to when the reveals start coming. All right, now I'm done talking about that because I want you to be able to experience it all yourself. I would say the best part about this book, my favorite part, the thing that made me go from, I like this, to, oh man, that was a wonderful story, I think is in Susanna's Clark ability to write a soft magic system. So I tend to lean towards hard magic systems. I love having magic explained to me. I love when there's rules around magic and there's a system behind it and I can understand it. I can wrap my head around it and the characters are having to figure out ways around the laws and the rules of magic in order to solve their dilemmas. I love that. However, I think that Susanna Clarke is a master at writing soft magic systems. So in Stranger Norel, I really enjoyed the way that she wrote her soft magic system, but I think in Piranesi, this is where she shows off how incredible she is at it. In fact, I would even go so far as to say, this may be my favorite way soft magic has ever been written that I've read. And it's not necessarily because the magic system itself is my favorite, it's the way that she wrote it. So Piranesi has this awe, this reverence 
admiration for the house and for the way it functions and the way it's ever changing and the way it's ever moving and the way it seems to live and breathe he has so much respect for which makes it really easy for the readers also to just sink into that almost passive just awe of this thing that is bigger than you and I something that we can't contain something that we can't understand or master. And the reason I love this so much is because it's just bigger than you and I. It feels to me the way Susanna Clarke writes her soft magic systems, and especially in this book, to me, I, I read it and I think this is what magic would feel like if it were real. If magic were actually here on earth with us, this is how it would feel. I don't know if this is how it would look, but this is how it would feel. Just vast, just bigger, not something that our silly, measly human minds could ever understand, could ever put laws around, could ever um, contain or conquer or master. No, it's bigger than us. And I love that feeling. Not in a confusing, overwhelming way, just in a awe-inspiring way. So the story, eventually, things do start unfolding, things do start getting revealed and falling into place, and I do think that she set those things up very, very well. Um, it is a book that has answers, but also at the end you don't have them all. And the reason is because of magic. Not in like the kitschy, funny way that we say it now, where it's like, oh, it happened because of magic. No, in a way that if magic were real, this is how the world would be. We wouldn't come out of the other end of the story understanding it. We'd come out of the other end of the story saying, this is a lot bigger than we are. And I love that. I love that so much. The feeling that when the story's done, or rather when we're done with the story, the story's not done. The feeling that the world is bigger than we are, that the magic is bigger than we are, that the story is bigger than we are. And why? Because our little human brains could never comprehend the depth and the vastness that is the magic of this world. And that's just such a cool feeling. I feel I feel like Piranesi throughout this entire book is, is just in awe of this house and I come out of it with that exact same feeling. And I just, I don't know. Piranesi is a delight to follow. He is a delightful main character. Um, the house that we're in, I love stories that are rooms and rooms and rooms and never ending rooms and everything's changing and everything's moving and everything's breathing and a labyrinth and mysteries and add on to it the fact that maybe possibly the house is making you insane. Like I just, I can't, I can't, I can't with how much I love this premise. It's so many things that I love about magic and fantasy anyway, but then add on top of it a slow unraveling and a slow revealing, and then add on top of it that it's probably my favorite way soft magic has ever, that I've ever read. It's just, oh, it was a really good book. And it was one of those books that the, the experience of going through it the first time was so much fun to understand things a little bit more. And then as soon as I finished it, I just wanted to turn back around and read it again and see it all from the perspective of the knowledge that I have now. It was just, it was a delight to read. Next, we're gonna talk about The Bone Shard Daughter, which I think I might have even enjoyed a little bit more than Piranesi. I'm not positive. I think Piranesi was definitely like more masterfully written, but I may have even enjoyed this story more. So, okay, The Bone Shard Daughter has five perspectives, two main perspectives, so we'll start there. The main, main perspective is Lynn. So this kingdom runs on bone shard magic. I'll explain it in a minute. So Lynn is the emperor's daughter, and we start with her at memory loss, a trope that I don't even like, but it's in both these books that I loved, because nearly no trope can't be done well. That was confusingly said. Most tropes can be done well. It's just, you know, sometimes we don't like seeing them all the time or don't like the way they're usually executed. Doesn't matter. So Lynn, um, okay, so she has a father who's the emperor. She has a foster brother slash adoptive. They say foster brother in the book, but it's essentially like an adoptive brother. And when her father took in the adoptive brother, he brought in a sickness with him that caused memory loss for him and memory loss for her. He's regained a lot of his memories. She hasn't. So we're in this world with this sort of 
vagueness um, to us where she doesn't know, she doesn't have a lot of information because she doesn't have a lot of her memories. That means she doesn't have a lot of personality either, which makes her a little bit harder to connect with there at the beginning. But it also makes it to be a wonderful way to get to know the world because we don't have info dumping. We don't have this narrative voice taking a step back to explain things to us and then we get back to the story. We're learning things really organically and slowly and it is a hard magic system and it's one of the coolest magic systems. I know I'm throwing out like big phrases out here, but it's such a cool magic system and it's different from anything I've read. I've read some that kind of are similar here and there, but this is different. This is just different and it's dark and it's wonderful. So anyway, Lynn doesn't have her memories, so she is kind of in a competition with her brother in that her father wants her to inherit the kingdom, but she needs to regain her memories before he'll start teaching her bone shard magic, and in order for her to be the emperor, she has to know bone shard magic. If she doesn't accomplish this, the throne will be given to her brother. Or at least that's all we know at the beginning. This is not a predictable story. What, the, what you think is gonna happen with that setup, there's so many twists and turns. Okay, then we have Javis. He's the, again, I don't know if I'm saying these names correctly. Then we have Javis. He's the other main perspective and he's a smuggler. So <laughs> he's a delight. Where Lynn doesn't have a lot of personality, Javis is wonderful. So he lives in a different part of the kingdom. His wife disappeared, I think it was seven years ago maybe, and he's been searching her for her for about that long. And um, so he's on a mission to try to find and rescue his wife, but he needs money to be able to accomplish these things, so he's become a smuggler and in the process, accidentally, just the most wonderful, sweetest character to follow. Because he's sort of in smuggling people and children, um, to protect them from the empire. In doing this, he's kind of become a hero of his people, but he's not really trying to have that status because he's trying to be under the radar. Then we also have two other characters that are connected and I really don't know how to say their names. Do you ever do this where you see a name and you don't actually pronounce it in your head? You just recognize that name almost like as a symbol and you keep moving. So then when it's time to say the name out loud, you realize I'm not positive I'm gonna say that correctly. So the other two perspectives are Ranami and Falu. So Ramani and Falu are connected. Falu comes from a more um, wealthy and privileged upbringing and she is also a, a she's a daughter of someone with power in her community. And then Ramani is uh, a gutter orphan. She, she was raised with nothing. <laughs> and these two are dating, they're connected, and uh, Falu is learning the realities of the sparsity of her kingdom and what people are suffering. And Ramani is trying to cause an uprising of sorts. She's, she's trying to, she's trying to fix things a little bit. And these two are, are teaming up to do it. Uh, but yeah, that's a simple. And then there's one last perspective and that's Sand. And I won't tell you anything about Sand except that Sand also doesn't have any memories and she's on an island with a bunch of other people that don't have memories and don't know how they got there, don't know why they're there. And that's all I'll say because Sand is a mysterious perspective. That's a lot of information, isn't it? It's such a digestible book. In fact, the next time I do another one of those sci-fi and fantasy books for beginners, this book will be on there. And I know it doesn't sound like it with all that setup because that's a lot of different characters to balance and they're in different regions of the world. So it seems like that's a lot to keep track of, but it's not. It's a really digestible writing style. It's not flowery, it's not, which by the way, Piranesi has beautiful prose. Um, it, the prose isn't beautiful or complex or anything like that. It's just, it's not, it's not technically bad in any way. It's just simple. The prose is very simple and readable and easy to flow with. Um, I would say that The Bone Shard Daughter is one of those books that would easily, it, it is an adult book, but it would easily uh, fit with people that read more YA because it has a lot of YA um, tropes or similarities along with also a lot of adult 
uh, themes, themes is what I should say. So, you know, uh, Lynn's perspective is very coming of age, having a kind of control of control, controlling cryptive father competition with her brother. Um, the two, the two female perspectives that are connected, uh, there's a lot of angst in their relationship. So there's certainly things that aren't exclusive to YA, but oftentimes happen in YA, um, that are executed with less angst. I think YA tends to be pretty angsty, which is fine. I was an angsty teen. So there's a lot of uh, themes that oftentimes show up in YA and feel for familiar, but are done in a totally different way. And it's so good. But then there's a lot of adult themes and, and stuff that happens that it doesn't matter. It's a really digestible read, and I think it's one that a lot of people could easily connect with and run with. Also, I forgot to mention, I don't know how I forgot to mention, but I forgot to mention, Javis also has an animal companion. Its name is Mephi? Mimphi? And, and it, he's a delight. It's, it's like this water creature. I kind of picture it as like a dragon, like a water dragon. And I, oh, he is the sweetest, most wonderful talking animal. I don't even like talking animal companions. Sweetest, most wonderful talking animal companion ever in all of existence. So these different perspectives are very different from each other. They're different geographical locations. They're different, uh, they're different struggles, different personality types. But one common theme throughout this book is that they're all trying to navigate their way around the powers that be to accomplish their individual missions. They do start connecting near the end, and I really love the way she's built up this world that feels so distinct, yet it connects so well and so seamlessly. The magic, which I teased earlier, is so cool. So bone shard magic, it's dark. It's bad. Bone shard magic. So the way this empire is run is there's a spot behind your ear. Every single person born in this empire is forced to give up a shard of their bone and it's kept in the empire. And only the emperor is able to do bone shard magic or is allowed to, knows how to, I don't really know. So they create these constructs, which are these living, living things that have been kind of pieced together. So like think an animal that has, you know, the head of this and the body of that. They've been kind of pieced together and these bone shards, you write a sort of command or formula onto the shard of bone and then put it inside the construct and that bone shard powers the construct. And this construct is loyal to whoever created it, or if the command says that it can be loyal to other people, then that's fine. They can be very simplistic creatures, easily tricked, easily whatever, but they just have a very simple mission, like they're just a spy or something like that. Um, or they can have very complex commands that, that contains multiple shards. But the problem with this is that when someone's bone shard is, is in use, it it harms the person that it was taken from. So they could get shard sickness, which means that they become quite ill or even could die over their shard being used. It can be a really gradual thing, but it's it, it causes a lot of strife within the kingdom, but it also causes a lot of moral dilemmas as things start unfolding. So, I've given you a lot of information about this story. I've, I've tried to keep it vague enough that you just have set up information because I assure you, this story does not go in directions that you would expect. This is a story where the basic setup I think is fairly easy to understand and easy to roll with, but as things start revealing as things start coming undone and as we learn more about bone shard magic and more about the history of this world and more about what's going on, it gets dark and it gets to be one of those things where you kind of have to deconstruct a lot of stuff to decide morally what's acceptable for our characters to do here because there's so much going on. But I love how twisted it gets because this is a dark magic system. I mean, the, the, the basic concept of how the magic works is dark. And I love that the story reflected that. Not in like a horror kind of dark. Don't worry, you're probably not gonna be scared. Just dark in the sense of this is not an easy thing to reckon with. And for some of our characters, they kind of have to reckon with it in order to move forward. And in order to 
free this empire in order to save this empire from the way things are happening, the way the, the, the messiness that is this empire in order to start unraveling it and start fixing it, they have a lot of moral dilemmas of using the bone shard magic or how it's been used up to this point and how to move forward. There's so much tied up in this and I love that it's not just like, oh yeah, the magic is dark, but also in order to solve the problems and, and, and just in the basic setup of the characters and what drives them, um, there's just a lot to, there, there's a lot to unpack there. It's a really unique story. It's a really unique world. It's a really unique story. It's a really unique magic system. And the dilemmas that we end up facing after things start being exposed to us is also very unique. I can see this not working for everybody because like I said, it is a story that I think easily falls into YA and adult. And I could definitely see like, if you're completely opposed to YA, you may not like it, but I'm not, so I loved it. I thought it was brilliant. It is an adult novel, um, but I do think it's one that is really accessible for pretty much anybody, and that was so well done, so well done. So there you go, those are some gush reviews for two books that I finished recently, both of which I thought were just so ridiculously good, and I do apologize, but I'm going to be pushing these on you. I don't know what to tell you. I just, I loved them. I loved them so much and I hope you'll check one or both of them out. They're two very, very different stories. So hopefully this will appeal to somebody. If you've read these stories, I'd love to continue chatting with you about them. Just do the spoiler space by space thing so we don't spoil people. And if you are going to read them, please let me know in the comments and let me know when you do read them what you thought of them. I love both these stories, highly recommend them. I post videos every Tuesday through Friday. I'll see you again soon, bye.